Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Maggie. I'm a third year medical student currently on my OBGYN rotation. I run this business and this channel with my brother John because we used to be professional MCAT tutors and now we just kind of do all of it on our website and on YouTube. And today I'm gonna make a video that's kind of going back to our roots, kind of how we started, which is passage breakdowns of the free resources of the AMC. So if you're looking for any passage breakdowns of anything on the sample test, then we have all those on a playlist. We have a lot of the FLE5, the scored exam, as well on our YouTube, but we're we're going to get around to making all of these videos. It's just, we were very busy making videos for all of the paid double AMC one through fours. So if you're looking for any passage breakdowns, any explanations of double AMC one through four, then make sure to check that out on our website. But today we're gonna to be looking at passage six and psych -soc section of the FLA five, the scored exam on the double AMC. So it starts out, you can read the title, Neighborhood Context and the Risk of Childbearing Among Metropolitan Area Black Adolescents. Okay, so pretty good information about what we're gonna be reading, right? I always like to frame things, especially in psychosoc and um, cars. So it starts out, using both structural and ecological perspectives, researchers examined childbearing among African-American adolescents in metropolitan areas of the US. So basically just the title, right? But we're told that we're going to be using both structural and ecological perspectives. So perhaps we're going to get some explanation of what those structural and ecological perspectives are. Sam, we do. The structural perspective focuses on how living in low SES neighborhoods can affect the risk of adolescent childbearing. So those are our two variables, right? Independent variable is gonna be like living in low SES neighborhoods. The dependent variable is going to be the risk of adolescent childbearing. So this perspective is divided into two explanations. Structural explanation one posits that the shift of industrial production away from urban centers led to an outmigration of middle-class African-American families and a subsequent concentration of poverty in some African-American neighborhoods. Okay, so they're taking industrial production out of the center of the cities, moving them out. Middle-class African-American families are moving out, leaving kind of like impoverished people in these like pockets, which I guess they are positing could possibly affect the risk of adolescent childbearing. Structural explanation two posits that residential segregation in urban areas, it concentrates poverty and contributes to neighborhood decline. So again, kind of break it down saying that where people tend to live in urban areas is like naturally segregated, whether for good or bad, which presumably kind of concentrates like systematically oppressed groups, which could contribute to these poverty pockets and possible neighborhood decline. It's kind of what it sounds like. This third paragraph says the ecological perspective, so we're not talking about structural anymore, we're talking about ecological, suggests that a neighborhood's impact on childbearing is mediated by characteristics and changes in families. So the structural perspective was all about the neighborhoods are kind of affecting the risk. The ecological perspective says that, okay, the neighborhood affects the risk, but it's because of the families who live there. So it says the ecological perspective includes a potentiator model, which refers to the correspondence or which refers to correspondence between risks from the environment and those from the family, as well as a protective model, which describes how more affluent families tend to protect their adolescents from risks in the environment. So again, both of these are about the families. The potentiator model kind of sounds like it's saying that environment and family could mix and make things worse. And then the protective model is saying that maybe affluent families are like a protective factor or decrease the risk from the environment on adolescent childbearing. Okay, data were attained from the panel study of income dynamics and were based on a sample of 940 African-American females born between 1953 and 1968. By age 20, 37.7% of these females experienced a premarital birth, 6% by age 16, 22, but eight by age 18. SES was derived from census data and measured at age 14. Bunch of like methods crap that I don't care about. Psychosocial is like all about being able to like quickly interpret like research stuff. Results indicated that living in a highly segregated neighborhood was associated with an elevated rate of premarital births regardless of neighborhood SES. So that's interesting because this whole like structural perspective was all about how SES is like the important factor of the neighborhood that increases that risk. But this is saying that it's more segregation rather than um, SES. In addition, adolescents who lived in low SES households, lived with one parent, had multiple siblings, or moved frequently, experienced higher rates of a premarital first birth before age 20, 
as compared to those who do not experience these same conditions. Okay, so when looking at specifically premarital first birth before age 20, then I guess SES uh, does matter. Also living in a single parent household or having a lot of siblings or moving frequently. Okay, so long story short, I just spent eight minutes basically talking about this passage and you shouldn't be spending eight minutes on this entire passage like questions and passage included. The reason why I just take so long to describe these things in these videos is because like, you're not coming here just so that I can read it and you can understand the same amount that you understood when you read it for yourself. I want you guys to be thinking about these things because like, especially early in your studies, I think that, or if you're like scoring really bad, I think that there is like something to taking untimed passages so that you can really slow down and teach yourself kind of how to read. Okay, now let's go into the questions. The results of the study support which correlation? So this question and a lot of correlation questions on the MCAT really just want you to know the difference between positive and negative correlation. Like they're not gonna be that difficult if you can really tease out positive and negative correlation. Of course, positive correlation means as one variable goes up, the other one goes up as well. Negative correlation means as one variable goes up, the other goes down. So it has nothing to do with like the vibes. Like it can be like a really like a morbid result, but a positive correlation if that makes sense. So, okay. Is there a positive correlation between degree of neighborhood segregation and neighborhood SES? So as neighborhood segregation goes up, neighborhood SES goes up. No, right? At neighborhood SES goes down. I don't even know that's actually supported by the study, but it was just like the vibe of what they were telling us up here. Maybe like it doesn't even say that, like it doesn't even tell us exactly what that is. The, I got the vibe that as neighborhood segregation goes up, the neighborhood SES goes down, but I guess I don't even have like real data to say that. So A is not right. B, a positive correlation between degree of neighborhood segregation and rate of premarital births. So as neighborhood segregation goes up, premarital birth goes up. That is what this first result is saying right here, right? Highly segregated neighborhood, elevated rate of premarital birth. So B is correct. We can look at C and D though, a negative correlation between neighborhood SES and neighborhood poverty level. So as neighborhood SES goes up, the poverty level goes down. That honestly makes sense, but it's kind of the same thing I ran into with a, which is like, I don't have like actual data to say that in here. Like it, it just makes sense to me in my head, but B is supported by actual data in, in the passage. And then D, a negative correlation between neighborhood poverty level. So as poverty level goes up, rate of premarital births goes down. That's not supported in the passage, right? So Bs are correct there. Suburbanization is most likely to be studied by researchers working with which of the four theoretical perspectives from the passage? So this question is kind of asking you, like, do you know what suburbanization is? So let's see what the AAMC thinks suburbanization is, because I don't care what Google thinks it is or what I think it is. I care what the AAMC thinks it is. Let's see. It says suburbanization is the outmigration from cities to suburbs, which often involves middle class residents leaving behind low income residents. So that sounds exactly like one of our theories that we came across, right? I think it was one of the structural ones. Let's go back up and look. Structural explanation one posits that the shift of industrial production away from urban centers led to an outmigration of middle-class African-American families and a concentration of poverty in some neighborhoods that were still left in those urban centers. So that's exactly what it's talking about. If you didn't get this one right, it was probably because you didn't really know what suburbanization is. Put that ish on an Anki card. I didn't know what it was before I took this passage like yesterday. Your psych search Anki deck is probably gonna be thick but hopefully it'll be like quick to get through because it's just like quick definitions that you need to know. The next question says, which combination of theories from the passage is most likely to share assumptions with the life course approach? So again, gotta know what the life course approach is. And if you don't know what it is, like definition wise, you can probably kind of figure out what it's saying. It's gonna look at over time, how you, things, how things happen to you in your life over the course of time. The AAMC technically says the life course approach posits that early life events influence an individual's later life outcomes. So I'm looking for the theories from the passage that talk about anything that happened to these adolescents early in life, anything that happened in their childhood. And remember, like we weren't told like specifics about that, but what we were told is that in these ecological perspectives, they were talking about their families and presumably these people have been with their families for their, you know, most of their lives. If you got this question wrong, I urge you to ask yourself what about either one of these structural perspectives has to do with like 
things in this adolescence life especially like life course approach is usually talking about like sort of like relationships or like individual level type things that happen to those individuals rather than like the systemic systematic whatever kind of like oh their neighborhood their socioeconomic status when you hear life course i want you to think things like childhood um, relationships with parents like stuff like that those might those little micro level relationships or interactions that can affect how someone develops over the course of time. So yeah, that's basically the answer is I think it's D because both of these models were the ecological perspectives where they talked about families and whereas the, all the structural explanations talked about like systematic factors that were just they're too big to really ever be talked about in the life course approach. Like this is more like like functionalism type stuff. If you like to put like a, a name to everything that the MCAT gives you, this would be more like functionalism, macro sociological stuff. The next question says, due to the assertion that the local environment influences adolescents' norms and values, the ecological perspective is most similar to which sociological theory? So looking at the answer choices, I can tell that this is talking about those theories of deviance or whatever, like social strain, differential association, and labeling are like the three theories of deviance. I don't know what disengagement theory is. The solution text says something about old individuals disengaging from society, so I don't know if that's in your content book, that's cool. But anyway, I'm gonna give you a way to kind of differentiate between these different deviance theories. So first off, deviance is like not being in line with the social norms. That is, that is what deviance is. Usually we think about it as like crime or like antisocial behaviors. Social strain theory or strain theory says that basically you have this deviant behavior because there's a difference between what you need and what you have. So, you know, I think the common thing that we're taught is like, oh, an individual steals bread from a store because they need food. So that's an act of deviance. They need food, they don't have food, so they obtain that goal through deviance. So that's like social strain theory. Think of the, all these things in examples. I swear it's gonna help. Labeling theory is like pretty self-explanatory. It's that if you label someone as like a criminal, then they'll become a criminal. So it's just, it's almost like the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? But in the context of deviance, whereas differential association theory is, is the right answer because it's talking about your environment. So including like the people that you interact with. So if you interact with a lot of criminals, then you, you might become a criminal. Or you're more likely to become a criminal. That's differential association theory. It's not very intuitive. I think that one is, but you can put this down on Anki card if you want, because this is obviously how they like to talk about it. Local environments influencing norms and values. That one's the correct answer. The last question says, in subsequent research, the study has expanded to examine how high SES African-American adolescents adapt to predominantly white neighborhoods which concept would be least applicable to this follow-up study so again this is just another psych social question that's like asking you to define all of these things and see if they fit into what they're talking about at all so a says front stage self so this one again is kind of self-explanatory so if you are an african-american adolescent and you're in a white neighborhood obviously i have no clue what that is like but I'm assuming that this question wants us to think that these adolescents may put up some sort of front or they may kind of change who they like are presenting themselves to be around these people that are not part of their sort of in-group. I guess that's what it's saying. And like people do this all the time, right? Like there is a front stage self of you when you're in your college classes compared to you when you're at Thanksgiving with your family. Like there's kind of always this aspect of front stage self, but it can be relevant in this scenario because we're presuming that African-American adolescents may act differently around a bunch of white people. I at least think it's an applicable concept. And then intersectionality. So intersectionality is like the uh, combination of any two demographic variables that you can think of. So gender, SES, ethnicity, sexuality, all of those sort of like demographic type stuff. If you are combining two of them, then you have an aspect of intersectionality. And like the whole point of intersectionality is to say that you can't compare, you know, the experience to being black and the experience to being high SES and just like add them up. Like there is not a summative effect, there's more of like a multiplicative effect. 
that you can't necessarily understand from just adding the two kind of demographics together. Sort of a, I don't know, sort of a floofy kind of definition for a very real concept. But anyway, so we are talking about two different things, right? We're talking about race and SES here. So intersectionality would be applicable. Social role conflict. So I think that this could be applicable because social role conflict is gonna be like, okay, there's two social roles and they're conflicting. Very, I'm so smart, Maggie. So maybe these individuals, sort of like intersectionality, maybe they feel a certain social role from being part of a high SES family. Maybe they feel some sort of social role for being an African American. Maybe they feel a social role from being in a white neighborhood. I don't really know, but you can imagine that maybe these roles would conflict and they would have to sort of rectify those two things to, to decide what they're gonna do or which role that they're gonna like kind of pursue. So I can understand that. Demographic transition. I put this picture up here. You guys are probably like, just get to the right answer already. Demographic transition is this concept that is explained by the, like this model about the population of um, developing and developed countries. So already like that doesn't make any sense, right? Like we're talking about adolescent pregnancy in the, um, in the passage. So this could be relevant, right? Mm, not really, I think that's a stretch. And plus we're not even talking about that at all in the subsequent research. So demographic transition is like when a country is first like still developing uh they don't have like very good medical care and stuff like that so people die earlier but there's a very high birth rate and then um as you get better medical care and stuff like that better food resources whatever you get more old people and the birth rates start declining so this is in like developed countries like i'm sure america is probably about you know in the declining or in maybe in the stationary phase i think J is it japan or china is in the declining stage one of the like large developed um, east asian countries kind of have a like a very low birth rate and a declining sort of population so that's not really relevant so that's the right answer okay i think that's the last one again if you guys like want any help with double mcs one through four we have a product up on our on our website informyfuturedoctors.com if you just want help with the sample test or the fle5 then we have playlists on our youtube we can't put double mc one through four on our youtube because it is trademarked or copywritten or whatever so we have to like get you to say that you have bought those tests because we can't show them we can't show paid products but anyway okay i will see you guys in the next video let me know if you liked this or hated this and what you want to see next in the comments bye